of the things that happens at the center is we are privileged to have uh, some people as postdocs and uh, associates and adjuncts and all the rest of it. And Christian has long been uh, associated with the work of the center, and it's been a great delight and a privilege to, to have him uh, around. Uh, he is uh, an author of considerable note, uh, having written Lockdown America, The Soft Cage, uh, The Freedom, and now, of course, uh, Tropic of Chaos. Um, I was trying to think about how else to introduce him, and I happened to be in the elevator in my building, and the woman got in, and the opposite got in and said, what's that book you're reading? So I showed it to her, and she said, who's this guy? And I tried to describe him, and she said, oh, he's a pundit. <laughs> And, I, and I, I wasn't sure whether this is meant as a compliment or as a criticism. So I said, is that a compliment or a criticism? She said, oh no, it's a compliment. Uh, it's really good to have, uh, uh, good to have a, a pundit around. So <laughs> if, you're, if you want to put something on your CV, it, it's, uh, it's a pundit who's good to have around. Okay, <laughs> okay good. But anyway, so, so it's, uh, it's really terrific to have Christian here. It's a fantastic book that he's... Uh, uh, produced and, and it raises lots of questions and lots of interesting uh, ideas and I hope that we can have a discussion and debate and I think the format will be that uh, Christian is going to talk for some you know, 10, 15 minutes, something like that about the book and some of the ideas uh, which uh, come out of the book and which are not necessarily even handled in the book and then we'll get into a little bit of dialogue and then we will open it up uh, for, for you to have a discussion with him. So Christian, if you like okay. to anyway. So thank you all for coming out and sorry about the um, confusion. Uh, and also you, uh, Vijay Prashad was unable to make it because Metro North has been closed due to the storm and he lives in Northampton. So we're, we're missing him, his presence. Um, and thanks to David and the center. I was actually, um, I came to the center as a postdoc and it was the fulfillment of my original hopes as a, an academic in my education to finally study with David Harvey. So this book and all the other work really owes a lot to David's work. Um, the, the idea of the book, the thesis of the book is that climate change doesn't just look like bad weather. It also looks like religious warfare, banditry, counterinsurgency, border militarization, and that the connection between, the causal connection between climate change and various forms of violence may be attenuated, but it is very real and can be fleshed out. Um, so it, a couple days ago, there was a report released from Columbia that showed a correlation between El Nino's, El Nino events and violence. And, and the report didn't really explain what that, it sort of, um, the paper sort of, uh, you know, guessed at what some of the causes could be. But of course, what the, the connections between violence and climate change run through all of the human institutions that are essentially what you would call imperialism, or more specifically, capitalism operating on a global scale. More specifically, what's happening now throughout the Global South is a, what I call the catastrophic convergence, which is a convergence of two pre-existing crises with the onset of anthropogenic climate change. And those pre-existing crises are the legacy of Cold War militarism, which has seeded much of the Global South with cheap weaponry and bands of armed men trained in asymmetrical warfare, be it as guerrillas or as mercenaries or as counterinsurgents. So they're trained in torture, smuggling, interrogation, assassination, small unit combat. And counterinsurgency, which was a crucial part of the Cold War's hot proxy wars, is particularly damaging to societies because it takes as its object the civilian society and not uh, as in conventional warfare, an opposing army. So the, the methods of counterinsurgency counter necessarily attack the social solidarity that I was mentioning in our warm-up there. And so societies uh, are not only 
littered with cheap weaponry and men trained in the arts of assassination and killing and smuggling, but also very often traumatized in a specific way that, that, that primes them for further violence. People are uprooted from their homelands. They forget or are forced to forget their original languages. They move to cities. They are forced to turn against their uh, countrymen and, and even fellow townsmen. The, the, an example of this, of course, probably the quintessential example of this is Guatemala, where you know, as is always the case in counterinsurgency, one of the army's methods along with burning villages and relocating people into strategic hamlets where they could be observed was the establishment of civil patrols or uh, you know, uh, civilian auxiliaries, which had the effect of forcing people to, you know, in some cases, kill and torture and interrogate their own community members. So the, the effects of that beyond just the human rights abuses are intense and they leave societies very battered. So you see in Central America, for example, murder rates in some countries that are as high as were the death tolls during the civil wars of the 1980s. But there's no longer any cause. There aren't two sides in the conflict. It's just the, uh, the reverberations of Cold War militarism. The other pre-existing crisis into which climate change now comes is the crisis of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism has also ripped these societies of the global south to pieces in many cases. The long story short is that the, the, uh, the capitalist economies of the world are developing after World War II uh, in large part on the basis of the incredible destruction of wealth that was part of World War II. So the golden era of capitalism internationally was based on the recovery from World War II. Once that is sort of achieved in many ways, economic stagnation sets in, falling rates of profit, and the whole social democratic compact and compromise that marked capitalist development during the Cold War also begins to fall apart. And David has written about this brilliantly in numerous books, most recently, the uh, short history of neoliberalism, and before that, uh, conditions of postmodernity. But so the crisis of the Keynesian model, if you will, leads to an embrace globally of radical free market economics, the ideas that Hayek lays out in the 1930s and, and were pushing in from the right wing fringe become by the late 70s, early 80s, the policy uh, in, the, in, in the West. And the, the knock on effect of that in the global South is that as Volcker, the chairman of the Federal Reserve in the US, jacks interest rates in the, early, in the late 70s, early 80s, with the intention of plunging the US economy into a cold bath recession to help discipline labor unions here, all of the outstanding loans in the global south, most, most of which were borrowed on variable interest rates, suddenly soar just as the world economy plunges into recession. That leads to the debt crisis. The debt crisis leads to the opportunity of the World Bank and IMF to impose structural adjustment on societies that have by and large been associated with increased poverty and increased inequality and a wholesale reduction of the presence of the state. And so into this crisis now comes climate change. And so, I mean, maybe the, the best way to illustrate this is how I open the book. I open the book with the death of a, a um, pastoralist, a Turkana pastoralist in Northwest Kenya named Ekaru Lorman, who's been killed the day before and he's lying there dead in the desert. And he asked, why has this guy been killed? At one level, he's been killed in a cattle raid. Uh, it's neighboring tribe, the Pakots, came to steal his cattle and he was killed along with six other people. But, um, you know, the raid was driven by the fact that there's the worst drought in 60 years in the Horn of Africa, which is linked to climate change. It fits the pattern that climate scientists have explained will unfold. But, so why, why is the, the, this, the, the response, the adaptation on the ground to go and steal your neighbor's cattle with an AK-47? Partly because the state has withdrawn all the old programs of veterinary services and well drilling and programs for water harvesting. All of that has been rolled up in the name of structural adjustment and market efficiency. So there aren't enough services for people. So they cluster around what few water holes there are. There's no browse left for the animals. It's, it's drying up. So people are 
trying to replace their herds by stealing their neighbors. And why is this traditional activity of cattle raiding becoming so violent? Some of you no doubt read the news about this cattle raid right across the border from Kenya in Sudan in which 600 people were killed last week. And in northwest Kenya, the conditions are similar. Uh, hundreds of people a year die. The police are constantly patrolling, paramilitary police backed up by helicopters. The Ugandan army will cross the border into Kenya. The roads are unsafe to travel when there aren't cattle to raid. Cattle raiders will shoot up civilian buses. And every day in these communities, people are being killed and cattle are being stolen. And that wasn't the case in traditional raiding. The answer to that in large part is that weaponry is so cheap. And weaponry is so cheap because the Horn of Africa was one of the many hot front lines in the Cold War. And to, to reduce the story to just one kind of prime example, the collapse of Somalia means that that entire region is flooded with guns and lawlessness that now extends out into the Indian Ocean. Why did Somalia collapse? Somalia collapsed because, unfortunately, uh, a, the socialist dictator, Said Bari, there's a coup d'etat in 1969, and he is, declares himself a socialist, but uh, is more than anything a Somali irredentist and nationalist, and he launches a covert war against the Ethiopia right after there's been a, a socialist coup in Ethiopia. And he's trying to reclaim the Ogden region, which is a Somali populated area of Ethiopia. Once he finds out that the Cubans who are supporting him are also have advisors and trainers in Ethiopia, Said Bari switches sides and in the Cold War. And the Carter administration gladly comes in to support Somalia with money from Saudi Arabia and arms from Pakistan. And what ensues from the late 70s until the early 90s is that both sides in the Cold War, in some cases, I would say, you know, with the best of intentions, pour weaponry into this conflict. The end result of which is the collapse of Said Bari's military and then with it the collapse of his state. And there hasn't been any kind of law and order in Somalia since. And so weaponry flows out to people like Ekuru Lorman and to the Pakot who killed him. So that's an example of the catastrophic convergence, how neoliberalism, the legacies of Cold War militarism, and the crisis of climate change all combine to express themselves as increased violence. It also, there's other examples in the book that I could get into, but it, it, you can find the same combination of forces in more urbanized settings. So just very quickly, Kyrgyzstan, last year, ethnic violence. The root cause was that Kyrgyzstan gets 90% of its electricity from hydroelectric power. There's been the worst drought in living memory over the last decade in Central Asia. The main hydroelectric dam was at the lowest level ever for water. The government had to start rationing power. As it rationed power, industry laid people off. The more people who were laid off, the less consumption there is, the more unemployment there is. Then the government decides it's going to re-engage a privatization program that had stalled, and it's going to privatize the utilities. So to make the assets more attractive, it doubles the tariff on power. At the same time, one of the worst winters on record hits Kyrgyzstan, pipes are bursting, pensioners are freezing to death, cattle are freezing to death. They shut down all schools and government institutions for two months. The country just essentially shut down. They're coming out of that, and the president announces that he's going to double the tariff on power again. And so people hit the streets protesting the cost of living. And what, be, what starts out as a protest around class issues and, and uh, the cost of living devolves into ethnic violence because there are these pools of lumpenized young Uzbek and Kyrgyz men who don't have jobs, they don't have education, they hang out in casinos drinking vodka, getting involved in the underworld, and that element turns these protests into violent pogroms. And so we then read in the paper, Uzbeks and Kyrgyz are, are at each other's throats as they apparently do every couple decades. But really, underneath that economic crisis, underneath that, that ethnic violence, is an economic crisis beneath which is, but not reducible to, which is this climatologically driven crisis, the drought and the uh, intense winter. So the rest of the book un, you know, explores that dynamic in different ways in different places. And in the end, I try not to be a total buzzkill and um, <laughs> rather cryptically uh, uh, return to the issue that, that Dave and I were talking about before, um, which is the state, the role of the state in coming up with a solution, both in terms of how we adapt to climate change and uh, how we are to mitigate its effects, that is to say, cutting 
uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So that's, that's the book in a nutshell. Um, and just Let me, uh, I mean, this idea of a catastrophic convergence, uh, it actually becomes more and more compelling as you go through the book. And uh, for me, one of the things I love about this book is it's a fantastic work of geography. And I'm a geographer, actually, so. And, and, uh, and, and what Christian does is to get on the ground and one minute you're in Kenya, then you're in Somalia, and then you're in uh, Afghanistan, and then you're in Kyrgyzstan, and then you're in India, and then you're in you know, Latin America, and so on. And I think that actually what comes out, one of the, methodologically in geography, we often have this problem of how do, you, how do you pay attention to the particularities at the same time as you pay attention to the big picture? And I think this is a fantastic book that does that that actually there's a lot of attention to these particularities. So you get a sense that there's something different that went on in Kenya than was going on in Somalia and, and, and Kyrgyzstan. But on the other hand, the patterning of the air around this idea of a catastrophic convergence is, is, is really very, very strong. And I think this is, this, you know, one of the things that gets a bit weighty after a bit is you, you, you turn to the next continent and you say, oh my God, I'm going to have another... <laughs> Another, another, another lot of that, and you do actually. It's just kind of so. That's what's the distressing side of the book. Um, but there are some, some actually questions I wanted to, 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 to sort of get to. You start off the book uh, towards the beginning with an account of how the Pentagon has got hold of this climate change stuff, and then starts to talk about you know how this is a major threat to U.S. security and and all the rest of it. Now we know the Pentagon. And the military industrial complex uh, usually lies through its teeth about things like, you know, I don't know, missile gaps and all the rest of it. And so one of the questions I, th I think I had about that is, are they, are they upping the story in some way? Are they making it appear even worse than it really is? And this, this, this I think, relates a little bit to one of the questions which underlies the nature of, of the story you tell in, in, in the book. To what degree are you up in the story a little bit in the sense of going to all of the negative kinds of things without looking a little bit more at some of the, 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 the positive sides of it? I mean, this struck me very much on the Latin American stuff. I mean, you do talk about the MST, you do talk in Bolivia about what went on around the water wars, and so you start to see, well, okay, there's something really positive uh, going on here as well as the, the real downer stuff. So. I wonder, I wonder first if you could talk a little bit more about how you see the military apparatus using uh, this as, as a reason to actually sort of, I don't know, get more resources and, and, and actually redefine its mission around more dirty wars, which, which is what it seems to be doing, and of course more technologies and, 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 uh, you know, and then all of the, the privatized companies that are being part of that apparatus. Uh, are they, uh, you know, how, how are they approaching this? Well, I, I don't think that, um, I mean, I definitely focus on the, the negative side of current world politics, um, but I don't think uh, in overlooking some of the more positive stuff, I mean, my, the mission in this book is to sound an alarm, and the science is pretty clear, and it sounds crazy to say in such nice settings on such a nice day, even though we did have a hurricane. But the science is pretty clear that we are headed in a very bad direction. And that's what the Pentagon refers to again and again. They, they rely on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the UN's main clearinghouse for vetting climate science. It doesn't, the IPCC doesn't produce science itself. It vets science and tries to make it available to policymakers in a way that they can use to adapt and mitigate the climate crisis. And if anything, the IPCC is very conservative in its uh, findings and uh, in its, its, its assessments reports every four years. And I mean, the reason I don't think the military is particularly playing it up is because it's actually not that big a part of their discourse. Um, I mean, maybe I'm playing up the extent to which they focus on it. Um, it's a small sector of the kind of planning elite within the military think about this. It's been introduced into the Quadrennial Defense Review of the U.S., which is the strategic document that comes out every four years. But when the military are 
you know, expanding their special forces operations into Yemen and places like that, they don't refer to climate change as not part of the discourse. It's only at the kind of elite parts of the sort of intellectual elements of the Pentagon that this is an issue. But in a way, that doesn't really matter. Um, and I, I don't think that, that the, um, I don't think that it's just searching for enemies and profiteering that is driving this. I think that the world is in a profound crisis that can be very hard to see in New York City, but that, that the victory of capitalism over the left domestically around the world again and again and internationally, not that the left internationally embodied in the Soviet Union didn't have problems as I was explaining around Somalia, but that there, that there is, uh, you know, there's a whole new set of, of crises that are unfolding that are very real and um, that the Pentagon is, is, you know, is actually just responding to that in a way that ultimately will make the problem worse, but that it's quite genuine. They see, they see a planet in profound crisis and they are trying to come up with a way to manage, essentially, manage its decline militarily. Yeah, I sometimes think when they get into that, they create a mess and then they say it's due to something else. You know? <laughs> yeah. So in a way, I mean, your story is that they created a lot of this awful mess out there and now they're kind of saying, well, climate change and so that in a way that there's a, there's a self-perpetuating side to that military apparatus which, which comes through I think really strongly when you get into the historical dimensions of this which is the other side of the book that I think is very good that you're very good at, at looking at some of the historical roots of all of this taking back you know burning villages going back to British colonial practices and, and, and all the rest of it so I, I think there's that, that, that side of it but let me, let me ask you something else I mean one of the other concepts I actually had a bit of a problem with was, was this idea that of failed states. Uh, you, you sort of say, well, you know, the problem in, uh, with, you know, in Kenya or in Somalia in particular is you've got a failed state. And uh, I always want to ask the question, well, failure by, for whom? Who, who is it failing? And, and it turns out, of course, for some people, those so-called failed states are great. You know, I mean, they're having a great time, uh, you know, selling guns to them and, and doing all those kinds of things. So I, I wonder if, if, rather than sort of dividing the world into states that work, and you, you quote somebody who kind of says, well, okay, there's the states that work and then there's failed states. Rather than sort of dividing it that way, you might want to have a bit more nuanced kind of view as to what kinds of states there are. Mm -hmm. are there. I mean, I look at this country and frankly, I've looked at the last few months and I thought, we have a failed state here, yeah, so yeah. Why, the hell, why the hell, you know, and there's, a, and there's a sense in which maybe that's a too sharp a dichotomy. Yeah, possibly. I mean, I would say calling this country a failed state is too sharp, is, is a misuse of the term, but it is a right-wing term and I used it partly to be provocative because um, I think that there is a sort of... Um, disregard for the real crisis of violence in the global south, which I saw as a reporter. And I think that some, there's legitimacy to the term of a failed state because it's only very, very small minority capitalist interests that benefit out of failed states. Yes, they can get coal tan out of East Congo. They can get cocoa cheaper out of Cote d'Ivoire when there's crisis there. But it's a failed state in the terms that the mainstream means it, in that there's no law and order. Um, and I think it also does fail even uh, in terms of, even in the totally amoral terms of global capitalism. I don't think global capitalism benefits from having a new piracy problem. They've come up way, with ways of dealing with it. They you know, buy, you know, they ransom their way out of, of the, the situation in Somalia, but I think it's maybe not a crisis, but it's definitely a problem. And, and there are some parasitic interests that learn to operate in war zones and failed states. But ultimately, um, I think that there is enough of the, the, the political class internationally who would prefer to have a world divided between rich and poor and people in misery where you have access to their uh, resources without having to pay any fees and taxes, but would also like to not have their ships hijacked and would also like to not have to pile on security costs to do basic business in these regions. And there are in fact 
places that are off limits to capital. I mean, the land grabs that are going on in Africa, you can't do that in Somalia. You know? And if that spreads, a lot of these deals that the Pakistanis, Chinese, all, you know, the Harvard's uh, you know, investment fund have secured are going to be worthless if there's no basic law and order in places. And so I guess maybe that's, maybe that's kind of a right-wing position, but I have, I have, having been in failed states, I, I appreciate um, some rule of law. One other aspect uh, I'd like to get to is, uh, you know, we were talking earlier a little bit about the whole kind of question of the metabolic relation to nature. And of course, climate is just one aspect of that. I mean, we have land degradation, we have, you know, so, you know, when you're looking at the environmental issue, would you want to make it much broader than just climate change, or is that just one element of a whole package? Uh, how do you, how do you okay. see that? Um, and then maybe after, then I'll ask you the question. No, 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 because I, I, the plan was I was going to ask him a few questions as well. So, the, yeah, I end trying to come up with some, um, something hopeful. Um, I end with a discussion of, you know, Marx and Engels' idea of the metabolic rift, that capitalism is incompatible with nature, that nature has limits and capitalism potentially can grow forever. And argue that it's possible to bracket out climate change from the larger set of uh, overlapping environmental crises because it can, it, can, it can seem that climate change is all of the problems together because it is potentially the most catastrophic, but actually it's possibly just a subset. And the reason I do that is because the time frame, if we are to believe the science, and there is you know, a, a rather amazing scientific consensus around the seriousness of this problem. And if we were to believe that, the, uh, you know, we do not have another hundred years to work out this problem. We have to start dealing with it now, like immediately, in the next few decades. And that means that capitalism and these institutions have to solve the climate crisis. Is it at all conceivable that capitalism could solve all of these environmental crises over fishing, soil degradation, pollution of uh, you know, chemo uh, toxic chemicals in the environment? No, that's unrealistic. And that's just to think that capitalism in the next three decades has to reconcile itself with nature is impossible. Is it possible that capitalism can shift from burning coal and oil to generating energy in a way that does not load the atmosphere with CO2 and that thereby we can avoid tipping points to merely buy ourselves time to deal with all the other environmental crises. I hope it's possible and that's, that's the, what I try to do is break out climate change as a subset of the metabolic rift. And, and I leave un, unexamined on uh, the question of what are the real limits to capitalism um, I address only the climatological problem, and you know, as I was writing the book, I was wondering what would David think about that. I mean, what really are when when you're not, you know, when one is not just making an argument to 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 make a point about how powerful Marxism is in analyzing the situation, but when we're thinking politically here and now, realistically, uh, about what the possibilities are. What do we think about? How do we think about the limits of capital, uh, I mean, the limits of nature, and the potentially uh, apocalyptic scale of, of capitalism? Well, uh, you know, capitalism uh, has a, a tendency, uh, this is again Marx talking in terms of tendencies to degrade the two major sources of all wealth, i.e. the laborer and the soil. Uh, but it's competitive capitalism that does that. And so one of the questions which has arisen historically is, you know, are there ways to modify or underpin, if you like, uh, put, a, put a base under capitalist competition so that competition does not drive you into a sort of a après moi le déluge kind of politics in which uh, you just simply go for it and go for it and go for it. And actually this, this is a thesis that comes out very strongly in Marx's chapter on the working day when he kind of says individual capitalists maximizing their own interests in competition with each other will force laborers to work under you know, more and more degraded conditions until essentially they kill off all the laborers. 
So the answer is that even the capitalists themselves at some point or other will recognize that they need some sort of regulatory basis that says there's a limit below which you cannot go. And even capitalist class interests can support uh, the shortening of the working day or limits on the length of the working day. That, that is that you have to do something of that sort. And we've seen the same thing happening in the area of environmental regulation. The attempt is to put some base uh, under capital. And then the question is, who puts the base? Do the capitalists agree to it, or are they forced by external forces? In the case of the working day, it's working class that does it for them, and if, in effect protects them from their own stupidity uh, by getting well organized and all the rest of it. And then, of course, we have various other movements that are about protection of, of, of nature. So the history of capitalism has been, if you like, mitigated, the tendency has been mitigated a little bit by these counter forces. But one of the things we've seen, I mean, what is it the Republican Party wants to defund right now? They want to get rid of the EPA, right? They want to get rid of all environmental regulation. Uh, they want to get rid of all of that, you know. And, and this is the sort of crazy Koch brothers and, and that, and they, they're, they're, they're into the après moi le deluge kind of uh, politics. And the interesting question is, and I, I wrote a little piece about this recently where I kind of asked the question, you know, you know, Marx always thought a rebellious class, working class would destroy capitalism, but maybe the Koch brothers and the Republicans would do a better job. <laughs> Be precisely because, you know, with, with climate change and all the rest of it, they'll, you know. So I, 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 so I think there is, a, is an interesting political question, which then gets back to that other issue that, that lurks here, is what is the role of the state? And, and in this instance, it would have to be also a state system, a global state system when it comes to, to climate change. What would its role be in dealing with somehow or other this question of, of, of climate change? And what we've seen in things like the Kyoto Protocol is it's, it's not worked very well. The one where it did seem to work reasonably well was the Montreal uh, Protocol, which uh, curb CFC emissions. And there are some other examples. I mean, for instance, uh, DDT regulation was one where, to some degree, a configuration of states agreed on this. But with climate change, we haven't got to that point yet. And there's an interesting kind of question, and which actually takes me back uh, to the question of the military. If the military are really so convinced about the problem of climate change, why don't they go off and tell Perry? Uh, to get off saying it doesn't exist, you know, and because that, and say, look, we're going to get all our money out of dealing with this, so come on, get off that bandwagon. So I think there's a, so, so we, there's an interesting kind of political, set of political uh, questions there about what kind of regulatory apparatus will work. And this is one of the problems uh, that I have with uh, a lot of the contemporary left, is the contemporary left doesn't want to have anything to do necessarily with the state apparatus. It doesn't want to have anything to do necessarily with international agreements. It sort of takes the view that somehow or other this can be solved uh, by local initiatives and by you know, working in civil society. And I'm not against doing that at all. I think that's a great idea. Uh, but it, it forms what I would call a sort of a, an anti-capitalist politics of a certain sort, which is what I would call it a termite politics. Uh, you sort of gnaw away at the basis of the whole of capitalism and in the end it all falls down. And I think it's fine actually, except that you've got to figure out that the capitalists are not stupid. When they start to see things falling down, they'll bring out the exterminators and then watch out. <laughs> and, and so, so the, the termite politics doesn't work until, unless you can actually grab hold of state power and do something, which is why I was so excited about what's going on in Chile, that they're actually really going for the state and saying the state has to be radically reformed and radically reconfigured around a completely different uh, agenda. And I think part of the problem right now around the world of, of, you know, is that there is not enough pressure being put on individual states to force the kinds of agreements. I mean, Bolivia has really tried. Mm -hmm. They really tried, and, and I give them a great, tremendous credit for that. But uh, nobody else really wants to, 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 to go down that path. And when you look at somewhere like China, you, you, kind, of, you, you, you kind of say, you're not really sure how it's going to work in a place like that. So I think the question of, 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 of the regulation of our relation to nature 
cannot be decided by individual action. It has to be decided by a whole set of different scalar action, mm -hmm. activism at the base amongst individuals, activism at community level, local levels, and regional levels. I think that reorganizing cities, for example, around a bioregional kind of concept, and, 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 and dealing with this kind of crazy business of long commutes and all the rest of it, uh, the, the waste, the, you know, I, I mean, I think the most anti-ecological form of urbanization that's ever been invented is the American suburb. And something has to be done about suburbanization and anti-suburbanization politics. So there are many things of that kind, but those cannot be worked out without having actually different levels of decision making which are integrated with each other. And that seems to me to be one of the key things that comes out at the end of you, your book, that there's no solution to, 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 to these macro kind of problems <coughs> without having a very different kind of organizational structure as to how decisions are going to be made and how things are going to, going to work. You know, in, in terms of that, I, I, I've been thinking about this hurricane compared to Katrina. And I went to Katrina, I went to New Orleans, and I arrived four days after um, the the hurricane, um, and the, 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 you know, as you all know, the narrative of that was the failure of the state. And it was very unfortunate in a way that uh, the critique, the, a left-wing critique of the failure of the state unintentionally fed into this idea that's a, you know, a hallmark and a, and a talking point of the hard right, which is that the state is useless, it's no good. And I suspect that out of this hurricane, perhaps, because there's been a bit more planning, people might realize that in fact the state sometimes is absolutely essential and does do things well and that in fact there are no uh, individual solutions, that there's only collective solutions in the face of an emergency like a hurricane hitting New York, and we, we, it wasn't a hurricane when it arrived, but that, that potentially one part of climate change could be that as we face emergencies, people will be forced to realize, okay, wait, the government isn't just about plundering our taxes and handing it over to Halliburton. There are still elements of it that are about public service that, uh, that operate you know, on the basis of use values rather than exchange values and that we need to endorse and support those. And I think hopefully that will become more apparent as people realize that they, that they have to rely on it. But we'll see. Now, another qu a question I have for you about. Uh, the one, in Marxism, it, the working class is the class that is most theorized, and the ruling class becomes the capitalist, but doesn't really become a political entity. And it seems to me that the ruling class in many ways, and this is something I, I owe a lot of what I'm saying here to Doug Henwood, who I've discussed this with, and this is very much his ideas and, and part of a project he's working on about the ruling class, but it seems that the ruling class in many ways becomes politicized the same way the working class does, that it becomes a class for itself when it is threatened. And when that threat is removed, it's no longer coherent, uh, it's no longer thinking coherently as a class, it's then thinking as it is now, just as interest groups, sectional uh, interests. I mean, we don't, have, we don't have a healthcare policy for capitalism, we have a healthcare policy for the healthcare industry and the insurance industry, and it doesn't really make sense for the automobile industry. And it seems to me that the, you know, if you read history from the Kennedy era. I mean, they would talk explicitly about the system. What does it mean that we lost at the Bay of Pigs? What does it mean that the Russians got a dog into space for the system? And what do we do for the system? It seems like those discussions don't happen among the Western ruling classes because of their victories in a way. And I'm wondering if hopefully there's a new threat to force them to, in, to give a little, to, to keep a lot. But also, I'm wondering if you think that the crisis of nature may in fact force uh, elements of, of the political elites to embrace planning again. Because it seems that in the past that also was an element of external threat that forced uh, uh, you know, elements of the capitalist class to embrace planning, em embrace regulation, embrace some level of economic redistribution. I don't think they, I, I don't think they see the threat in the way that you would want them to. No. I mean, I don't see them. Uh, some of them do, and some of them don't. I mean, that's the problem. So there's no coherent class position about it. And again, it's factionalized. The energy companies, as you point out, 
spend all this money on climate change denial politics. Uh, and uh, so, and, and then another faction which is into environmental technologies is doing exactly the opposite, you know. So they're factionalized on this kind of question. I don't think they see it as, 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 a, as a major question that they have to unite around and, and really address. That's, that's my feeling about it, but that, you know, that, that, could, that could change. But the other, the other big, I think, problem is that, as, as you show in, in, in your book, in each, in each place you go to, there is a specific character <laughs> to how this crisis is felt and understood. In other words, there's, a, uh, there's an immediate, what Im immediately hits you as what the nature of the problem is. You don't necessarily think about drought or anything like that. You think about it in some other terms. And in each place, it's something different. And, the, and so you don't see the underlying kind of problem. And, and, and the scientists can see it, some other people can see it, but a lot of people don't even experience it, not even just the capitalist class, but people don't experience it as, if you like, that's the nature of the problem. So this is a particularly difficult kind of problem to, to, to address for that, for that, for that reason. Mm -hmm. Should we open it yeah. up to questions? Yeah, let's open it up now and uh, have you, so, yeah. You should probably stand up and, and, and shout so everybody hears it. Yeah, or at least, yeah. at least shout. It's a bit intimidating. Yeah, um, that's all right. No, it's very interesting where you said um, you hope that capitalism manages to run on green energy to buy up time in order to sort out all those other problems. Um, and I'm thinking of Tim Mitchell's kind of deconstructivist material history of the carbon complex, which said that political economy has been shaped by the sort of flavor of way that capitalists have to control the miners, which is different from the way that they have to control the, the laborers involved in, in the extraction of oil. Um, is there actually, you know, is there actually a transitional capitalism that is green? I mean, is, is there a sort of, you know, uh, uh, wind or solar flavored political economy of, of carbon demand? Well, there, there isn't one, no. Um, but there's potentially uh, an, you know, a shift in the energy industry. I mean, the, it's, the easy case to make is that the jig is up and that we have flown over the edge, the tipping points are coming, and um, you know, this civilization is going to collapse. That by the, by the time the effects of climate change kick in, the causes will have become so built up that it will be impossible to address. Um, the, the obvious tipping point is that the melting of the permafrost and the release of methane in the Arctic. Methane is a greenhouse gas 20 times more powerful than CO2. Once the primary cause of greenhouse gas buildup in the environment is the natural release of methane, there's very little civilization can do. So it's easy to make the case that we have crossed the point of no return. Uh, what's more difficult and somewhat uncomfortable for uh, me at least uh, as a person of the left is to try and come up with a realistic seeming uh, scenario for how we avoid that and it involves I think capitalism moving off of fossil fuels towards other forms of energy wind, solar and hydroelectric, hydroelectric. it is totally unrealistic to think I believe that the entire global economy which is primarily capitalist could be transformed in the time necessary could the energy sector be meaningly transformed? Possibly. That's a much different and smaller um, project. So that's, uh, you know, that's what I'm talking about. And there, there is movement in that direction, but there's tremendous pushback from the fossil fuel industry, which has all of this sunk capital, which is threatened with being turned into scrap metal if there's a, a policy shift away from fossil fuels. The other thing that, that happens is uh, this idea of you know, a class in itself or a business faction in itself versus a business faction for itself. The green energy people are lackadaisical. They're not politicized. They, they, they're not like the fossil fuel industry. They're not born out of armed conflict with workers. They don't defend their interests. They just you know, hope that their gadgets sell well. Can I just uh, add something to that? I mean, I want to emphasize this notion of time lags. Um, and I think, again, the CFC thing is a very good example. The Montreal Protocol was passed, what, 1982 or 5 or something? 87, I think. 87, was it? Okay, okay. 
1987. Uh, CFCs are only just now beginning to go down. Mm -hmm. so, so when you're looking at the climate change stuff, you're looking at time lags of 30 years, 40 years before you really start to clean out the stuff. So, so you've got to be really, you know, then that, that's why this is such a dangerous situation. If people don't see, you know, that what's, what the time horizon of a lot of business decisions right now is, you know, next six months and that's it. Uh, and that's where you get into this après moi, the deluge kind of stuff. Um, and, but you, you've got to have a much longer time horizon. And the big question is, who's going to have that time horizon? And who is going to sit and say to everybody, no, you cannot do that because on, that, on this other time horizon, this is what it looks like. And, and that's, that, that's going to be a disaster. So this is, a, this is again, one of, the, one of the issues. Yeah, was a, yeah. Um, well, there has to be a shift in cultural values in the West to, for, for, for the state to really engage in, a, in robust planning again. In China, um, you know, uh, political despotism does have its uh, benefits. They don't have those problems, you know. I mean, this is the efficient place to put the windmills. That's where they go. And I suspect that a lot of this nimbyism is funded uh, covertly by, by the, the, you know, fossil fuel industry. But um, in terms of the cultural shift. One thing about in terms of termite politics, the localista stuff, I agree that it's ultimately a lot of what is explicitly suggested by that politics of communities solving their own problems, being self-sufficient in the face of the collapse of civilization is totally unrealistic. But it, I think there's a, a, what Robert Merton, the old sociologist, would have called the latent and the manifest function of these movements. There's a group around the country, at least in Putney, Vermont, which is where I'm originally from, which has just been very badly flooded. Um, there's a transition Putney, and these groups that are about like reskilling and you know preparing for the post oil world, which I don't really believe in peak oil. And you can see that the manifest function is the idea that they're planning for the apocalypse, and it'll be like uh, a version of the 19th century with robust town meetings. But then the latent function is actually to build political and social solidarity that might be useful and in, for something completely different, like mobilizing around state policy and uh, you know, a, a, a much bigger set of solutions. So culture is, is essential, as your question points out, and it works in sometimes um, uh, slippery ways. 
That's not what I said. Okay, it was the opposite. Yeah. That, 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 in that example, it was that the state fails. Right. Because it, was, it, was, it, wasn't, at, it wasn't present. But then right. I was hoping maybe that's this that's time... I don't think. Yeah. I don't think. I don't think that's what David meant. I want to defend termites. I think they're fantastic animals. Yeah. <laughs> and ad actually, I think it's a fantastic form of politics. I mean, it's great. Uh, so I, I, I mean, it's, it's it's not it's not dismissive at all. Uh, but uh, anyway. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, and nobody's advocating for um, a return of um, you know the Soviet Union, that's not the model. It's what we're talking about, and what, what, we're, what we're doing here is, beforehand we were talking about, you know, how Tony Judd in his book, Ill Fares the Land, has this great line about how we have to rethink the state. And so that's what we're trying to do. I, it, it's not, uh, I wouldn't worry about, uh, you know, a communist takeover and all that kind of, you know, because it's just, the time frame doesn't lie. What we're talking about is trying to get the, the idea of government planning and regulation of capitalism to have some traction and legitimacy. I mean, I think that's like what is really uh, doable uh, and, and the real set of parameters of the discussion of how the left has to think about the state. And I don't think we're uh, dismissing uh, you know, anti-authoritarian left critiques. I didn't, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I take them seriously, but I also don't want to stop there. I, I also am aware of a kind of intense Romanticism of the local, romanticism of the community, an unthinking dismissal of the state. Um, and the opposite as well. That, 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 that's really my only intervention. Um, and I, I'm not sure that wariness actually exists. Not, not as a communist takeover, obviously, and that's absolutely uh, absurd and fantastic. Um, but again, just as a people's natural, uh, instinctual um, response or uh, towards this idea of law and order. <coughs> Well, look, if you two, yeah, you know, okay. The last couple of weeks, I've been reading sort of a lot of Murray Bookchin. I thought Murray Bookchin is in favor of municipal libertarianism. Now, municipal organization is, okay, it's not a state, is it? But on the other hand, when you start to say, what are the rules and regulations that are, exist within this municipal libertarianism, then he kind of says, well, you have to, you understand perfectly well, and this is one of the big critiques which is made, is that if, if you do not have means by which there are resources redis redistribu redistributed from one municipal libertarian entity to another, then that can be a recipe for enormous inequalities in the world. And the only way you can deal with that, he says, is where you start to have regional assemblies, which are, and then, you know, and pretty soon you're into a sort of, dare I say it, hierarchical forms, but no, you're not supposed to talk about hierarchies anymore, you know, Every, everything has to be horizontal, you know, and I like to be horizontal most of my life, but I actually like to stand up occasionally. <laughs> so, so, so I, I kind of think, so I think there's a, there's a way in which the left is often talking about these things which is, which is not helpful. And I agree with you entirely that the critique is there and it's a very solid critique, but when you look at something like a Murray Bookchin sort of structure, I'm sorry to say it looks to me like a territorial set of territorial forms which look like a state, feel like a state, and walk like a state, except they do so with a different kind of standard of how, re how the base relates to the various institutions which are, which are set in motion there. And then if you look at something like saying, I mentioned the CFC, the Montreal Protocol, how is that negotiated and how is it set up? Well, this is a very progressive thing to have happened. And if you wanted it to happen, the only way it could happen was actually by having state apparatuses there that could reach those, those agreements. 
And, 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 and particularly with the climate change thing, there's no way you're going to have to have something that looks like a state that does something like that and then kind of starts to regulate and, and, and set up certain rules and, and, and the rest of it. So we've got ourselves into a discursive kind of corner where we can't talk about a whole bunches of things. The critique is there, I agree with you entirely about the critique, but we're not able to talk about some of the other forms of organisation that can go to other levels of generality and start to deal with some of the, the major global problems that, that, that exist, which need organisations of some kind where we cannot have a global assembly to decide a certain thing because, you know, we, where are you going to put you know, enough problems getting 6.8 billion people in here? It'd be a rather hard push. So I, I kind of, so, so those are the issues that concern me, that, that by having to think about the structure of institutional arrangements, that we have to revolutionize institutional arrangements and it's very important that they get revolutionized in ways which take account the critique and the past failures but also which recognize some of the past successes. And I would cite something like the Montreal Pro Protocol as a past success. I mean, the ozone hole would be you know, 15 times larger than it currently is and we'd probably all be dying of skin cancer by now had that, you know, not, mm -hmm. had that not regulatory apparatus not been set up by international agreement. And, and so, you know, we, we've got to, 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 to start to be able to think at that level at the same time as we do indeed engage at per, I'm in favor of, of permanent termite politics. And, and, and I can tell you, termites are going to be here long after we've all disappeared. So uh, I have a great faith in, in the future of termites. Let's go right at the back, sorry. Let's go right at the back. I'm not talking about market mechanisms. I'm not adoring capitalism. I'm talking about this social system and what realistically what's going to happen in, in the next 30 years. I don't even think in terms that you, your question um, asks. I, don't, I, I never entertain questions like what kind of social system should there be in Somalia? It's, like a, it's a question that is, I find absurd. No offense. Um, first of all, it would have to be generated by people there and there are social systems there in failed states and it's warlordism and there's no progressive politics in a place where if you step out of line and you say something that the man with guns don't like and they can kill you and get away with it, there's nothing. There's no protest movement. There's no progressive politics in places like Cote d'Ivoire, in Afghanistan. There's, you know, the left is dead inside failed states. So maybe that's, that's why I embrace that label actually. That's why. It's because the left, I went to Afghanistan and, and it was looking for Actually, the first article I ever did from, Afghan from Iraq, I went and I wanted to find out what's up with the left. They once had the largest communist party in the world, or in the Middle East, in Iraq, and searched around for the left and realized, wow, when a state collapses and the right can kill anyone they want with total impunity, there is no space for an unarmed left. And there was no armed left in Iraq. And I guess that would be fundamentally why, that was the moment when, and that is why I think that term failed state is legitimate. Sure, capitalist interests can work within there, but the, you know, there's, from, our, from our point of view as progressives, there, it fails our agenda in the most profound way. There's no room for politics. In terms of a little bit of law and order, I mean, what, I'm just trying to disabuse people of any r romantic notions they have about what it's like to travel through a landscape, uh, you know, where instead of easy pass toll booths, there are, you know, uh, men with guns. You know, it's uh, it, it precludes all politics, and and there the the uh, in terms of thinking about the state, rethinking the state, it has to happen at all these different levels. I'm personally not so attracted to the larger questions. I didn't mean to dismiss actually your suggestion. What are these larger structures? What should they be like? And that's what you're talking about. For me, when I think about rethinking the state, I think about rethinking the discourse in everyday politics among normal people in America about what the role of government is. What is this thing that they talk about constantly on television? They're constantly heaping calumny and hatred on the public sector in the state. And I think that that is one of the first and most important places to intervene is in just like notions that circulate among regular people about what the public sector is, what the government is, what does it do. Corey Robin had a great article in, I think it was The Nation, where he, he argued you know, that he was trying to reclaim freedom. That was sort of the um, whole gist of the piece. But actually, within it was actually he was trying to rebrand the state as the institution that protects freedom. You know, it protects people's liberty against 
the dictatorship of the market. And you know, I think interventions like that are very important at, at, at a level of kind of everyday micropolitics. So that when we think about when we think about this this um, hurricane, it's an opportunity to to point things out. That you know, it was not some fee for service emergency service thing that helped anyone. It was the public sector. It was our tax money, you know, and it was forward thinking planning by bureaucrats that got the subway cars out of the yards that flooded so that we can get to work tomorrow. And to just remind, that, that's the first step, to remind people that there already are socialistic elements in capitalism, that capitalism has always depended on the state. And that's a first step. That's not a solution. That doesn't deal with these questions of what should the state look like. That's about like just reinvigorating some legitimacy, connecting the commonwealth and the state, the common good, the common interest with the public sector. We're, we're going to, excuse, excuse me, um, we're having to um, get out of here fairly soon, so um, what I think we're going to do is, I'll just take one more question here, and then, and then we'll have to wrap up, so yes, please. Some of us are working against the FTAs, and when you talk about order, you know there's an there's investor state litigation procedure tied to these trade agreements that mean that a corporation will supersede the state in power by, like in El Salvador, being able to, the Pacific Rim is suing the government of El Salvador for limiting their profit taking by protecting the environment against Sinai that will be used in gold extraction. Okay, so corporations are people and corporations can sue a state might we, how do we counterpose the power of the state when the corporation seems to be the defining power to maintain order? Well, I think if corporations are people, we should be able to put them in jail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and execute them. We've so, thought of that, but it's, you know, yeah, right. accusing them of murder, theft. Right. Okay, we should leave it here. And there's a reception outside, so we should continue this yes. informally outside. So thank you. Thank you very much.